Stuart Little by E.B. White, Pictures by Garth Williams. Chapter 12, The Schoolroom. While Dr. Carey was making repairs on the car, Stuart went shopping. He decided that, since he was about to take another long motor trip, he should have the proper clothes. He went to a doll shop where they had things which were the right size for him and outfitted him completely with, lugga with new luggage, suits, shirts, and accessories. He charged everything and was well pleased with his purchases. That night, he slept at the doctor's apartment. The next morning, Stuart started early to avoid traffic. He thought it would be a good idea to get out on the road before there were too many cars and trucks. He drove through Central Park to 100th, 110th Street, then over to the West Side Highway, then north to the Sawmill River Parkway. The car ran beautifully, and although people were inclined to stare at him, Stuart didn't mind. He was very careful not to press the button, which had caused so much trouble the day before. He made up his mind that he would never use that button again. Just as the sun was coming up, Stuart saw a man seated in thought by the side of the road. Stuart steered his car alongside, stopped, and put his head out. You're worried about something, aren't you? asked Stuart. Yes, I am, said the man, who was tall and mild. Can I help you in any way? Stuart asked Stuart in a friendly voice. The man shook his head. It's an impossible situation, I guess, he replied. You see, I'm the superintendent of schools in this town. That's not an impossible situation, said Stuart. It's bad, but not impossible. Well, continued the man, I've always got problems that I can't solve. Today, for instance, one of my teachers is sick. Miss Gunderson, her name is. She teaches number seven school. I've got to find a substitute for her, a teacher who will take her place. What's the matter with her, asked Stuart. I don't know exactly. The doctor says she may have rhinestones, replied the superintendent. Can't you find another teacher, asked Stuart. No, that's the trouble. There's nobody in this town who knows anything. No spare teachers, no anything. School is supposed to begin in an hour. I will be glad to take Miss Gunderson's place for a day, if you would like, suggested Stuart agreeably. The superintendent of schools looked up. Really? Certainly, said Stuart. Glad to. He opened the door of the little car and stepped out. Walking around to the rear, he opened the luggage compartment and took out his suitcase. If I'm to conduct a class in a schoolroom, I'd better take off these motoring togs and get into something more suitable, he said. Stuart climbed the bank, went into the bushes, and was back in a few minutes wearing a pepper and salt jacket, old striped trousers, a Windsor tie, and spectacles. He folded his other clothes and packed them away in the suitcase. Do you think you can maintain discipline? asked the superintendent. Of course I can, replied Stuart. I'll make the work interesting and the discipline will take care of itself. Don't worry about me. The man thanked him and they shook hands. At quarter before nine, the scholars had gathered in, number, in school number seven. When they missed Miss Gunderson, and word got round that there would be a substitute, they were delighted. A substitute, somebody whispered to someone else. A substitute, a substitute. The news traveled fast, and soon everyone in the schoolroom knew that they were all to have a rest from Mrs. for Miss Gunderson for at least a day, and were going to have the wonderful experience of being taught by a straight teacher whom nobody had ever seen before. Stuart arrived at nine. He parked his car briskly at the door of the school, stalked boldly into the room, found a yardstick leaning against Miss Gunderson's desk, and climbed hand over hand to the top. There he found an inkwell, a pointer, some pens and pencils, a bottle of ink, some chalk, a bell, two hairpins, 
and three or four books in a pile. Stuart scrambled nimbly up to the top of the stack of books and jumped for the button on the bell. His weight was enough to make it ring, and Stuart promptly slid down, walked to the front of the desk, and said, Let me have your attention, please. The boys and girls crowded around the desk to look at the substitute. Everyone talked at once, and they seemed to be very much pleased. The girls giggled, and the boys laughed, and everyone's eyes lit up with excitement to see such a small and good-looking teacher so appropriately dressed. Let me have your attention, please, repeated Stuart. As you know, Miss Gunderson is sick, and I am taking her place. What's the matter with her? asked Roy Hart eagerly. Vitamin trouble, replied Stuart. She took vitamin D when she needed A. She took B when she was short of C, and her system became overloaded with riboflavin, thymine, hydrochloride, and even with pyrodoxin, the need for which in human nutrition has not been established. Let it be a lesson for all of us. He glared fiercely at the children, and they made no more inquiries about Miss Gunderson. Everyone will now take his or her seat, commanded Stuart. The pupils filed obediently down the aisles and dropped into their seats, and in a moment there was silence in the classroom. Stuart cleared his throat, seizing a coat lapel in either hand to make himself look, up, look like a professor, Stuart began. Anybody absent? The scholars shook their heads. Anybody late? They shook their heads. Very well, said Stuart. What's the first subject you usually take up in the morning? Arithmetic, shouted the children. Bother, arithmetic, snapped Stuart. Let's skip it. There were wild shouts of enthusiasm at this suggestion. Everyone in the class seemed perfectly willing to skip arithmetic for one morning. What next do you study? asked Stuart. Spelling, cried the children. Well, said Stuart, a misspelled word is an abomination in the sight of anyone. I consider it a very fine thing to spell words correctly, and I strongly urge every one of you to buy a Webster's Collegiate Dictionary and consult it whenever you are in the slightest doubt. So much for spelling. What's next? The scholars were just as pleased to be let out of spelling as they were about arithmetic, and they shouted for joy, and everybody looked at everybody else and laughed and waved handkerchiefs and rulers, and some of the boys threw spitballs at some of the girls. Stuart had to climb onto the pile of books again and dive for the bell to restore order. What's next? he repeated. Writing, cried the scholars. Goodness, said Stuart in disgust. Don't you children know how to write yet? Certainly we do, yelled one and all. So much for that, then, said Stuart. Social studies comes next, cried Elizabeth Gardner eagerly. Social studies? Never heard of them, said Stuart. Instead of taking up any special subject this morning, why wouldn't it be a good idea if we just talked about something? The scholars glanced around at each other in expectancy. Could we talk about the way it feels to hold a snake in your hand and then it winds itself around your wrist? asked Arthur Greenlaw. We could, but I'd rather not, replied Stuart. Could we talk about sin and vice? pleaded Lydia and Lacey. Nope, said Stuart. Try again. Could we talk about the fat woman at the circus and she had hair all over her chin? begged Isidore Fren Feinberg reminiscently. No, said Stuart. I'll tell you. Let's talk about the king of the world. He looked around the room, hopefully to see how the children liked that idea. There isn't any king of the world, said Harry Jameson in disgust. What's the diff, said Stuart. There ought to be one. Kings are old-fashioned, said Harry. Well, all right then. Let's talk about the chairman of the world. The world gets into a lot of trouble because it has no chairman. I would like to be chairman of the world myself. You're too small, said Mary Bendix. Oh, fish feather, said Stuart. Size has nothing to do with it. It's temperament and the ability that count. 
The chairman has to have ability and he must know what's important. How many of you know what's important? Up went all the hands. Very good, said Stuart, cocking one leg across the other and shoving his hands in the pockets of his jacket. Henry Rockemeyer, you tell us what is important. A shaft of sunlight at the end of a dark afternoon, a note a note in music, and the way the back of a baby's neck smells if its mother keeps it tidy, answered Henry. Correct, said Stuart. Those are important things. You forgot one thing, though. Mary Bendix, what did Henry Rackemeyer forget? He forgot ice cream with chocolate sauce on it, said Mary quickly. Exactly, said Stuart. Ice cream is important. Well, now, if I'm going to be chairman of the world this morning, we've got to have some rules. Otherwise, it'll be too confusing with everyone running every which way and helping himself to things and nobody behaving. We've got to have some laws if we're going to play this game. Can anybody suggest any good laws for the world? Albert Fernstrom raised his hand. Don't eat mushrooms. They might be toadstools, suggested Albert. That's not a law, said Stuart. That's merely a bit of friendly advice. Good advice, Albert, but advice and law are not the same thing. Law is much more solemn than advice. Law is extremely solemn. Anybody else think of a law for the world? Nick's on swiping anything, suggested John Poldowski solemnly. Very good, said Stuart. Good law. Never poison anything but rats, said Anthony Brindisi. That's no good, said Stuart. It's unfair to rats. A law has to be fair to everyone. Anthony looks sulky, but rats are unfair to us, he said. Rats are objectionable. I know they are, said Stuart, but from a rat's point of view, poison is objectionable. A chairman has to see all sides of a problem. Have you got a rat's point of view? asked Anthony. You look like you look a little like a rat. No, said Stuart. I have more the point of view of a mouse, which is very different. I see things whole. It's obvious to me that rats are underprivileged. They've never been able to get out in the open. Rats don't like the open, said Agnes Baretska. That's because whenever they come out, somebody sucks them. Rats might like the open if they were allowed to use it. Any other ideas for laws? Agnes Baretska raised her hand. There ought to be a law against fighting. Impractical, said Stuart. Men like to fight, but you're getting warm, Agnes. No scrapping, said Agnes timidly. Stuart shook his head. Absolutely no being mean, suggested Mildred, Mildred Hoffenstein. Very fine law, said Stuart. When I am chairman, anybody who is mean to anyone else is going to catch it. That won't work, remarked Herbert Prendergast. Some people are just naturally mean. Albert Fernstrom is always being mean to me. I'm not saying it'll work, said Stuart. It's a good law. And we'll give it a try. We'll give it a try right here and now. Somebody do something mean to somebody. Harry Jameson, you be mean to Catherine Stableford. Wait a minute now. What's that you've got in your hand, Catherine? It's a tiny it's a little tiny pillow stuffed with sweet balsam. Doesn't it say for you I pine, for you I balsam on it? Yes, said Catherine. Do you love it very much, asked Stuart. And yes, I do, said Catherine. Okay, Harry, grab it and take it away. Harry ran over to where Catherine sat, grabbed the little pillow from her hand, and ran back to his seat while Catherine screamed. Now then, said Stuart in a fierce voice, hold on. My good people, while your chairman consults the book of rules, he pretended to thumb through a book. Here we are, page 492. Absolutely no being mean. Page 560. Nick's on swiping anything. Harry Jameson has broken two laws. The law against being mean and the law against swiping. Let's get Harry and set him back before he becomes so mean people will hardly recognize him anymore. Come on. Stuart ran for the yardstick and slid down like a fireman coming down a pole in a firehouse. 
He ran toward Harry, and the other children jumped up from their seats and raced up and down the aisles and crowded around Harry while Stuart demanded that he give up the little pillow. Harry looked frightened, although he knew it was just a test. He gave Catherine the pillow. There, it worked pretty well, said Stuart. No being mean is a perfectly good law. He wiped his face with his handkerchief, for he was quite warm from the exertion of being chairman of the world. It had taken more running and leaping and sliding than he had imagined. Catherine was very much pleased to have her pillow back. Let's see that little pillow a minute, said Stuart, whose curiosity was beginning to get the better of him. Catherine showed it to him. It was about as long as Stuart was high. Stuart suddenly thought what a fine, sweet-smelling bed it would make for him. He began to want the pillow himself. That's a very pretty thing, said Stuart, trying to hide his eagerness. You don't want to sell it, do you? Oh, no, replied Catherine. It was a present to me. I suppose it was given you by a boy you met at Lake Hoptagon last summer, and it reminds you of him, murmured Stuart dreamily. Yes, it was, said Catherine, blushing. Ah, oh, said Stuart, summers are, are wonderful, aren't they, Catherine? Yes, and last summer was the most wonderful summer I had ever had in my life. I can imagine, replied Stuart. You're sure you wouldn't want to sell that little pillow? Catherine shook her head. Don't know as I blame you, replied Stuart quietly. Summertime is important. It's like a shaft of sunlight. Or a note of music, said Elizabeth Aikson. Or the way the back of a baby's neck smells if its mother keeps it tidy, said Marilyn Roberts. Stuart sighs. Never forget your summer times, my dears, he said. Well, I've got to be getting along. It's been a pleasure to know you all. Class is dismissed. Stuart strode rapidly to the door and climbed into the car, and with a final wave of his hand, drove off in the northerly direction, while the children raced alongside and screamed, Goodbye! 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 They all wished they could have a substitute every day instead of Miss Gunderson.